A chemical change is also known as a chemical reaction. You can tell that a chemical reaction has occurred by making observations before and after the reaction. Normally you'll notice things like a color change. In this case, this white salt changes to blue when water is added. You may also notice the formation of a precipitate. A precipitate is a solid that is formed after you mix two solutions together. When a gas is produced, you will normally observe bubbles being formed in the solution. You may see light being given off by the reaction or heat being given off by the reaction. These observations are also called evidence. The main pieces of evidence for chemical change would be a color change, the formation of a solid, liquid, or gas, light or heat being given off. In order to symbolize a chemical reaction, we often write chemical equations, and chemical equations require us to use many different symbols. In the form of a chemical equation, the positive symbol has several meanings. All of those meanings are essentially synonymous with each other, where a positive symbol means and or plus or reacts with. In a chemical equation, you'll also see an arrow. Now sometimes that arrow will be in a forward direction, and sometimes that arrow will actually go forwards and backwards, depending on how the reaction proceeds. Either way, an arrow means reacts to form or yields. Sometimes you might also use the word produces. Next to the chemical formulas in the chemical equation, you'll often see letters in parentheses, and that indicates the state of matter that each of those substances are in. So an S in parentheses means a solid. This S is also used to represent that insoluble precipitate that forms after mixing two solutions together. An L in parentheses means the substance is in liquid form, a G means gas, and an AQ in parentheses means that you have an aqueous solution. Aqueous simply means that that chemical is dissolved in water. There are several different notations that might occur above the arrow. These symbols that occur above the arrow indicate the conditions that must be present in order for the reaction to occur. So if you see a triangle above the arrow, that triangle is really a Greek letter D or delta, and that indicates that heat needs to be added in order for the chemical reaction to occur. The chemical formula above the arrow indicates the presence of a catalyst. A catalyst is any chemical that causes the rate of a chemical reaction to get faster. But the catalyst is not consumed in the reaction, meaning if you started with two grams of the catalyst at the beginning, you would still have two grams of catalyst at the end. So we write the formula of the catalyst above the arrow. You may also see a temperature written above the arrow or a unit of pressure written above the arrow. And those would be the different environmental conditions that would need to be present in order for that reaction to occur. There are different ways to write chemical equations. The first way is just a sentence. This is the form that we commonly use when we're speaking with each other, or maybe when you're reading a description out of a textbook. So for example, when heated, solid mercury 2 oxide yields liquid mercury and gaseous oxygen. But it takes a while to write out that whole sentence if you're writing it by hand. So that sentence can also be converted into a word equation in order to reduce the time needed to describe the reaction. So in place of the word yields, we can substitute an arrow. And in place of the word and, we can substitute that positive sign. So now it reads mercury 2 oxide yields mercury and oxygen. Lastly, we can write a formula equation. A formula equation is the fastest way to write a chemical equation where instead of writing the names of the chemicals, you write the formulas of the chemicals. So mercury 2 oxide has the chemical formula HgO. Mercury by itself has the chemical formula Hg. Oxygen gas by itself has the chemical formula O2. And then I can add all of those different symbols into my formula equation so that the person reading the reaction has more information about what is happening. So because my original sentence said when heated, I would need to put a delta over my arrow to indicate that the mercury oxide has to be heated in order for it to break down. My sentence also describes the states of matter that each of those chemicals are in. So because mercury oxide is a solid, I put a little S in parentheses next to the mercury oxide. After the reaction, the mercury that is produced is in a liquid form and the oxygen that is produced is in a gas form. So I use the symbols L and G in parentheses. When chemical reactions occur, they have to follow the law of conservation of mass. 
The law of conservation of mass states that mass cannot be created or destroyed. It can only be converted from one form to the other. So in this example, I have two hydrogen molecules and one oxygen molecule on the left side of my arrow, and those react to form two water molecules, which have the formula H2O. So notice I have four hydrogens before the reaction, and I have four hydrogens after the reaction. I have two oxygens before and two oxygens after. So all of the atoms that were present before the reaction are simply pulled apart and rearranged so that they're converted into a new chemical compound. So when you're looking at a chemical equation, the mass of the reactants always has to equal the mass of the products. Another way of saying that is that the number of atoms that react have to be equal to the number of atoms that are produced. My reactants are always on the left side of my equation before the yield sign, and my products are always on the right side of the equation after the yield sign. In order to make sure that my chemical reaction follows the law of conservation of mass, I have to add coefficients before the chemical formulas. That ensures that I have four hydrogens before and four hydrogens after, and two oxygens before the reaction and two oxygens after the reaction. Balancing equations is relatively easy as long as you follow a few simple steps. The first thing is that you need to start with an unbalanced chemical equation. So in this particular reaction I have sodium hydroxide reacting with sulfuric acid to make sodium sulfate and water. It's very important that when you're translating an equation from a word equation to a formula equation that you get the chemical formulas correct because not having the correct chemical formulas will cause your equation to not be balanced properly. Once I've written down my chemical equation, I need to make an inventory of my elements. To do this, I'm just going to make a list of all the atoms that are involved in the reaction. And then I'm going to count how many atoms are present on the reactant side before the reaction and how many atoms are present on the product side after the reaction. And by looking at this inventory table, you can tell that my equation is not balanced because the number of sodium and hydrogen before and after the reaction don't match. Then I need to begin placing coefficients before the chemical formulas until the number of elements on each side are equal. It's important that when you add these coefficients, you always keep your inventory current, so that as you add a coefficient, you change all of the elements that are affected in your inventory table below. It's also very important that you don't change any of the subscripts in the chemical formula. You may find it helpful to draw a box around the chemical formula so that you make sure you don't change the subscripts inside that box and that you only add big whole number coefficients before each chemical formula. There are a few helpful tricks to balancing chemical equations. I always find it easiest to balance the oxygen and the hydrogen atoms last. I find that normally as you go through and balance the other elements in the chemical equation, the oxygen and hydrogen kind of work themselves out and you don't end up having to mess with them. If you get to a point where there's two atoms on one side and three atoms on the other, find a common multiple. So the least common multiple between two and three is six. So I would want to make the atoms on both sides of the equation equal to six. You may also find it helpful to use a decimal or a fraction, but this should just be temporary. If you needed to use like a three and a half, you would want to double all of the coefficients to get rid of that half so that you end up with whole number coefficients. And sometimes you just get stuck and you need to start again. And so a good way to attack a problem that's giving you difficulty, you can just pick a random number and put it before the first compound and start the whole balancing process all over again. Here's an example of the process of converting a sentence into a chemical equation and then balancing it. Solid aluminum metal reacts with a solution of zinc chloride to produce solid zinc metal and aqueous aluminum chloride. So the first thing I'm going to do is translate all of those words into symbols. So I can begin with the solid aluminum metal. I know that the chemical symbol for aluminum is Al. And because it's in solid form, I can put a small s next to it. The next word say reacts with, which is represented by a positive symbol, a solution of zinc chloride. The formula for zinc chloride is ZnCl2. And because it says solution, I know that it's in an aqueous 
form, so I write AQ in parentheses. To produce also means to yield, which is represented by an arrow. I produce solid zinc metal, so zinc all by itself is ZN, and that's in a solid form. And aqueous aluminum chloride, the formula for aluminum chloride is AlCl3, and I can put the aqueous symbol next to that. In order to begin balancing, I need to make a list of the elements that are present. So I've got aluminum, zinc, and chlorine. And then I inventory the number of atoms before the reaction and after the reaction. So before the reaction, I have one aluminum, one zinc, and two chlorines. After the reaction, I have one zinc, one aluminum, and three chlorines. Now the aluminum and the zinc are already balanced, but the chlorine is not. Here I have two atoms of chlorine on one side and three on the other. So I need six chlorines on both sides. In order to do that, I need to add a coefficient of three before the zinc chloride. Now notice that that not only changes the number of chlorines, but it also changes the zinc. So my zinc becomes three, and my chlorine becomes six. I also want to add two before the aluminum chloride in order to change the chlorines to six. But by adding that two, I also change the number of aluminums to two. So it appears as though I've messed up my equation. I now have one element balanced, and two that are not balanced, but I can easily fix those by adding coefficients before the aluminum and the zinc. So to get the aluminum to balance, I just need to add a two before the aluminum. That changes that to two. And add a three before the zinc, changing that number to three. Notice that now the numbers on my left side and the numbers on my right side match, and that indicates that my equation is balanced.